What Happens in the Woods is a true crime podcast. We discuss events that are often violent in nature. Listener's discretion is advised. The Unsolved Case. Possibly the hardest eventuality to accept in the true crime and law enforcement communities. Even with new advances made in science and technology, cases still go cold. To this day, there are families that do not have closure and criminals who have never been caught. It's everyone's worst nightmare. The years of not knowing, no answers, and no updates for loved ones. Memories fade. Anyone with information grows old. More new cases take time and focus away from the older ones until it is lost in the files among other unsolved cold cases. We want to believe in the system. We want to seek closure. We want answers. In our season finale episode, we explored one of the most searched and discussed local Washington state cases from the 1980s due to their being unsolved. There was hope after the last update given back in 2011, but since then, the case has simply gone cold once more. This is True Crime Podcast, What Happens in the Woods, with your host, Jess and Bryce. Let's get started. to the season three finale episode everyone hi bryce hello we made it through another season without killing each other oh, okay is that an option are you thinking about this constantly what is that an option i don't know no i'm not trying to go to jail for murder okay i, I don't think i would do well in prison no i i mean i think i'd do okay I think I'd be fine. Actually, I'd be fine. I would be fine. Okay. I just don't want to go. Yeah. Yeah. I value my my freedom and being on my own schedule too much. Okay. I'd be fine. I could do it. I just don't want to. There's a difference there. Sure. Yeah. Why are you looking at me like that? (laughs) Uh, Okay. (laughs) All right. Uh, so yeah, season three finale, we've had a a great season, brought a lot of cases to you guys. We hope that you've been interested in and engaged with, maybe spark some conversations. And we of course love how many people listen to us from all over the world. We, you know, really appreciate that. We hope that everyone continues to listen, uh, because everybody's favorite WTF Wednesdays will start back up on September 15th. Are you ready for the what the fucks? Yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> you're ready for all the fuckery? I'm just nervous uh, about what you, you're you going to do. Like what? what you've got planned or what you are going to surprise me with or. Nothing. I'm concerned. <laughs> I am hugely concerned. No. No. Oh, okay. Nothing. That's it's funny because. It's all fine. Yeah. It's yeah. all fine. It's all fine. Okay. All right. Yeah. We'll be back with what the fucks. Um, our contest finished. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the winner was notified by message. I didn't really want to share anybody's information if they didn't want it to be shared. So congratulations Yay. to the winner of our our merch, our first ever merch, our podcast logo tee. They get the choice between like the, the fitted kind of girly fit or the just a regular t-shirt. And then there's two different logos. So options there um thank you to everyone that participated and we you know definitely like to do these fun things we hope that you guys like them too 
Um, merch is still available to buy on the website. I'm just not like going to continuously put out merch. But uh, if you do get any, please post pictures with, you know, T-shirt or whatever you get. Um, we'd love to see that. Like, yes. Yeah. And we'll probably do some other merch. I definitely have something different planned for WTF Wednesdays. I wanted to have a little bit of fun with that. So be on the lookout for that coming soon. Otherwise, uh, you can get what we've got up there through the website until September 3rd. And then I'm going to kind of take that off and, and focus on the what the fucks. Any updates? Well, just, Price. Uh, <laughs> uh, Australia is in the lead. Australia is back. Australia is back, back. Our friends. Yeah. In I'm Sydney. Glad. Yes. Oh, Sydney. Sydney. Okay. I'm happy. It makes me happy. All of it makes me happy. But second place, like the next one would probably surprise you. Oh? Yeah. Why? Guess. Like country-wise? Yeah. Or continent or what? Yeah. Country-wise, basically, yeah. Is it someplace we haven't hit before? Like hasn't come up before? Not really. So not like South America? No. Okay. I don't know because we've hit... I. Th- Every place but, like, Africa? Yeah. We're in Africa. Nigeria. Really? Yeah. Awesome. We have this huge, massive surge in Nigeria. Lagos, Nigeria. Okay. And I practice uh, my my, uh, official, uh, in their official language, my, Uh my greeting to them. You did? Yeah, I did. Okay. I mean, are you going to... Are you ready for it? Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. Hello, Nigeria. (laughs) What is their... Their official language is English. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that either. Well, you learn something new every day. Yes. Okay, I was worried for a second that you were going to... What? I don't know what you were going to You thought I was going to ruin it? Well, I don't know, because, you know, you, you hear... Like, you see things, like, where people try to say something, and they say... Like they end up cussing somebody out or no. calling somebody a pig face no, or something like that. Their official language is English. Whether that's really like what happens, you know, there. Yeah. There are a ton of languages, but well, on yeah. their official language officially is English. Interesting. I kind of feel, well, I don't know how. Because I, I, I was scared. Yeah. I was scared that they were going to be the number one country and then I would have to like get it like someone that did like Nigerian or their official language for, yeah. for the, you know, our disclaimer. Yeah. That would not be English. Yeah. So, but it was English. So I was like, Oh, okay. I lucked out. <laughs> but yeah. it, I mean, they do have different languages and I would have right. probably done it in one of their like native languages. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. I feel like that's kind of more appropriate. I don't know. But I, you know, like I, I researched it. It was like Lagos. Interesting. Nigeria is, English. And that, even at that, I would have probably done pidgin English because they say that's what they usually speak there. Oh, okay. But, yeah. Hmm. I don't know. I It's kind of sad to me that English is... I don't know. I, I guess that's a whole other conversation. I am I am happy, though, that... I guess that just makes me happy that, you know, people from multiple like diverse cultures and and other places are interested in true crime too and have found us so that's cool it is yeah i like it okay that's all i got that's all you got yep okay all right well our case for this season our last case has been unsolved since the 1980s This is the Mineral Washington murders, sometimes referred to as the Tube Sock murders. Have you heard of this one? No. You haven't heard of this one? No. I feel like this one is like wildly, like, it's searchable. If you are into true crime, if, I mean, like, if you were to go to Google right now and Google like murders in Washington, this is going to come up like 75% of the time. Okay. Like somehow it it comes up like pretty much as often as like the I-5 killer. 
mm-hmm. like that serial killer yeah. or I mean, I found it referenced when I've searched Gary Ridgeway, Green River Killer. I found it like referenced multiple times. Yeah. So I I think I think it it's because it's unsolved that that's why it's like this weird I don't know with especially with true crime people who are interested in it or people who you know everybody likes to talk about Ted Bundy everybody likes to talk about Green River Killer. It's like this weird thing of, oh, I, I've got to solve this. Yeah. Like this weird fever pitch comes in or something. I don't know. And people just become speculative and and they want to really like delve into this. So before we go further, I just want to say when like when we do these cases, we try to be as respectful as possible to like the victims and the families. This one had a lot of negative like response online from people who want to talk about the case and then family members or people who knew these victims come on these chats or websites and they're like, please stop speculating. We don't want to talk about this anymore. Yeah. So I, I mean, the hope is in talking about these cases is not like to dredge up pain for anybody, but to hopefully just get information out there that is helpful in solving these murders it's it's just kind of the hope that somebody out there can do that for the families. And that is what drove me to want to talk about these these murders. Now, that being said, I did try to reach out to some people online who were like writers who researched this uh, family members. I didn't have any luck with that. I also was unable to request uh, records because the records are exempt from disclosure laws. Yeah. So according to information that I got from the sheriff's office. So if there's any update we can provide in the future, of course, I would love to do that. So I'm going to take you back to August 10th, 1985, when the Ruth Cooper and Stephen Harkins, a Tacoma, Washington couple, they set out on a camping trip. They were going to uh, Tool Lake. Ruth and Stephen had left a friend's wedding reception that like afternoon headed out to a remote part of Pierce County for the night. They were due back the next day on the 11th. By the 14th, when they didn't show up, their families reported them missing. Ruth was a single mother to a few children, ranging in ages from 15 to 20 at this time. They both were in training at a vocational school in Tacoma to become machinists. Uh There was like one thing that is noted between some similarities is age differences between the couples. So in Ruth and Stephen's case, Ruth was older by about 15 years. Okay. But they had been in a relationship for about two years at, at the point of their disappearance. And they were never heard from or seen again. Their car was seen by a warehouser employee parked on a road near the lake on the 12th. Reportedly, it wasn't unusual to see cars out there, so he didn't really think anything of it. Keep in mind, they were they left on the 10th, were supposed to be back the 11th. He sees the car on the 12th, not knowing what, you know, it's not out of the ordinary. People go on this, you know, to these lakes, they camp all the time. It's kind of an old logging road. It's It's not unheard of. So he just didn't really think anything of it. The employee then saw the car parked in the same area on the 14th which is the same day that the family members reported them missing. Yeah. Something about it being there, like seemingly undisturbed, did seem odd that day, so he took a look. Inside the car, he found the body of Stephen Harkings. Stephen was in, in the front seat of the car. He was in a sleeping bag, and he had been shot in the head. And there's no sign of anyone else around. Was he placed in the sleeping bag, or he was like sleeping in a sleeping bag, or what? You know what I mean? Yeah, like, it's it's unsure um, because there are there are a lot of details that I just I couldn't find I couldn't get because this is still and I don't want to say it's an active case because it is a cold case but they obviously have something the authorities do the sheriff whoever yeah. has something that they're still hoping will find them leads in this case because they don't give out a lot of information. So I'm not sure if the couple had spent the night in their car and maybe he was like in the sleeping bag and he was supposed to be in the car. 
or if they had been sleeping someplace outside of the car. And when he was killed, he was moved to yeah. the car. Okay. I'm not sure. Not sure on like where the actual murder took place. Okay. Was it in the car? Was it outside of the car? So like I said, there's no sign of anybody else. And this employee doesn't know that Ruth should be with him. He, he doesn't, you know, he's not aware. So Pierce County detectives start beginning, you know, their investigation, looking into things. They arrive at the conclusion that Stephen was shot and then Ruth was taken. While combing the search area around the car the next day, investigators come across the couple's dog, who had been with them on this trip, also shot and left for dead. Oh. I, I don't know what it is about animals that get killed, but it, it hits me. It's like the same category as children almost. Because yeah. they're, they're just so innocent. Not that people aren't innocent, but I don't know. It's, it's just a little bit of a harder thing to, to take. Yeah. Still no sign of Ruth, though. Her family conducted their own searches for her, going to areas with specific, like sp- specially trained tracking dogs. Yeah. They went out for weeks, and they couldn't find any trace of her anywhere. So the reception was the last place they were seen or heard from. Investigators, of course, you know, start questioning people who had attended that. And they get a potential lead. After Ruth and Stephen had left, there are reports that an unknown man showed up at the reception looking for Stephen in regards to some damage to Stephen's motorcycle. There's really not much more information given. Investigators, you know, also begin to look at any similar cases in the area and they come across a similar murder of a young couple from Kent that had just happened a few months prior in March. Was it in the same area? It would actually ends up being like three hours, three and a half hours away from where Ruth and Stephen were. Yeah. The MO is completely different, but they really were just kind of looking at whatever, whatever they could. So this was a couple, though, who had gone to a remote area to go camping and then gone missing. So this is Edward Smith and Kimberly Levine. They had only been living in the Kent area for like less than a year. They had met while studying at the University of Southeastern Massachusetts at Dartmouth. And they were set to return home to be with their families that summer to get married. Okay. So their bodies had been found near Vantage, Washington, over three hours away, like I said, from Ruth and Stephen's last location. Edward was found in a gravel pit with his hands bound and his throat cut. And as was in the case with Ruth, Kimberly was not found immediately. Her remains would actually not be found until two weeks prior to this August 10th date when Ruth and Stephen went camping. Um, So they they found her, but it was hard to tell because the like exposure to the elements. She had also been bound, but they believe her throat was also cut. Okay. Due to the lack of similarities in that, you know, MO between the two cases, authorities didn't think they were linked. They just were kind of looking at any possibility. There were no suspects, no apparent motives to their crime, um, just as it was in the case with Ruth and Stephen. So as time goes on, hope of catching the responsible parties for these crimes is less and less. Until Ruth's skull was found on October 26, over a mile away from where the car had been found. Um, this was at Hearts Lake. All right. Due to exposure and decomposure, it was identified by dental records. They would find the rest of her body and belongings two days later, close by. An autopsy would confirm she died from a gunshot shot wound to the abdomen. Reports state that she had been decapitated. However, I'm not sure if she was like actually killed that way or it was done like postmortem or if that was due to wild animals. That, that, again, not details that are really given. Yeah. One thing that stood out to investigators when her body was found was a tube sock that had been tied around her neck. So they have no clear leads. Investigators are turning to the community and they began getting this out with Crime Stoppers, any place that they can, any possible information, so that if anybody had recalled seeing them, any information, you know, either near where they, they were at the lakes, any, anything at all, but everything goes cold. So authorities have their hands full with this investigation. They're using any and all resources they have to find this. And then another couple goes missing just a little over a month later in a nearby area. 
And we're going to discuss that right after we get back from this break. In December of 1985, a seemingly unrelated incident took place when a young two-year-old girl was found wandering outside of a Tacoma area Kmart alone. So a shopper noticed that this you know, little girl is dazed. She's kind of confused. She's bruised up a little bit, and she brings the girl inside to have the store employees search for a parent. No one comes forward. The little girl is taken to a hospital. She's checked out, and then she's placed in temporary care. And she isn't really old enough to relay where her parents are, what happened. She just seems to be kind of unaware of how she showed up at that Kmart. Okay. And when asked, she states that mommy is in the trees. They don't really understand what that means. There's really no. (laughs) Nobody understands what that means. No, she's two. They mean mommy's in the trees. No, she's two years old. That's what she can say. Is she a gorilla? A gorilla? Like it's a rainforest? Yeah. Okay. So the little girl gets reunited with her grandmother after a photo of her is shown on the news. And authorities discover that her parents, Mike Reamer, um, who's age 36, and his girlfriend, Diana Robertson, age 21. Again, another 15-year difference between these guys. Yeah. They went missing after planning a trip into the remote woods near the Nisqually River. They were planning on going and cutting down a Christmas tree. They also um, were going to check on some of the animal traps. Mike was a a fur trader, so he had like lines of animal traps out in this area that he checked on regularly. So he was definitely not unfamiliar with this area that they were going to go be at that day. Mm. So this is now the third couple in the year that had gone out to the woods, seemingly just disappeared. And so far, two of those couples were not found alive. So there's not really, you know, investigators are kind of not hopeful that they're going to find this couple. Yeah. Within days, searches begin both um, by investigators and friends of Mike's who knew the locations of his trapping lines. Unfortunately, there's no luck in finding the couple. There's no immediate link between the couple's disappearance and then the two other couples that have been murdered. They're not really sure what's going on. So it's a cold and snowy day when Diana Robertson is found. uh, That's February of 1986 near Mineral, Washington. Her remains were found by a man who was just out walking his dog. And they also found nearby her was Mike Reamer's truck. In relation to where Ruth and Stephen were found, it's about 30 minutes away. So pretty, pretty like similar area. There's a lot of logging roads. There's a lot of lakes. There's a lot of just secluded area, wooded area that you could be in. Yeah. Mike is nowhere. They can't find him. So the similarities to Ruth's body when she was found are very close between her and Diana. An autopsy would confirm that it was indeed Diana. They had to confirm that because of exposure to the elements. Yeah. Also exposure to, you know, weather, that kind of stuff. It just, yeah, decomposer, decomposing had set in. Diana's cause of death, however, was 17 stab wounds to the abdomen, not a shot as was in Ruth's case. Okay. When searching the truck, there is blood that's found on the front seat due to the time exposed in the elements The only information investigators can get is that they can confirm it's human blood. They're not able to even identify blood type. They also find an envelope that it's like a manila envelope that's on the dash of the car with the writing, I love you, Diana. When compared to notes and cards that Mike had, you know, given people over the years, the FBI cannot positively identify that as the same handwriting Diana's mother, though, states that she's pretty confident that it is his handwriting. Of course, that leads to speculation as to why would why would he write that? Authorities now know they have a connection, at least to the murders of Ruth Cooper and Stephen Harkins. But by the time they do this. Like by the time they know this, it it's not helpful. Yeah. You know, they know they have a connection. It leads to more questions. And Mike is still missing. They they have no idea. You know, they're searching for him. They have no idea. Is he involved? What does that note mean? It just opens up a whole nother 
line of questioning and basically stalls the investigation. He's not immediately suspected, but Mike, because he's not found, yeah. is really their only person of interest. Oh, it is. It's suspect. You know. Right. Um, so they begin looking into the couple, of course. Multiple records of domestic disturbances have been made by Diana against Mike. The last resulted in an arrest for domestic assault just on October 19th. So just, you know, barely two months before this incident. Yeah. Mike had reportedly come to her home, busted through the door, and they pushed her into the ground and like shoved her face into the carpet and wouldn't let her up. Not sure what the argument was about or what the incident was about, and but she did follow through on filing charges. A court date had been set for January 22nd of 1986, and Mike was directed to have no contact with Diana. Okay. But the couple was out together. They were with their daughter in December. So we're, nobody's really sure. Did they reconcile? Did Mike you know, like force her and the little girl to come out with him? Yeah. Authorities don't know, but they put the word out that they want to speak with him. And it, not only in this case, but they want to talk to him about the other two cases as well. Mm -hmm. They never get the chance. So years go by. These cases are not solved. They often are looked at when new crimes come up that may be similar. One case you should be familiar with is the murder of Canadian couple Jay Cook and Tanya Vaughn. Uh, I always say this wrong. Kloyenberg. Yeah. So Jay Cook and Tanya Vaughn Kloyenberg. Um, that was in 1987. But we know the eventual outcome of, of their case. When DNA was found, it was William Earl Talbot uh -huh. that was convicted of those crimes. Yeah. There's another couple that had been murdered in 1986, and this was Robert and Dagmar Linton. The couple had been traveling from California up to Vancouver when they disappeared. That actually got solved as well. So Charles Sinclair would be caught and charged with their murders after he'd been using the couple's credit cards for purchases multiple times. Okay. So again, they come across possible things that might have led to help with their cases. Mm -hmm. Nothing, nothing is solved for them. And then there comes a little break for the families of Edward Smith and Kimberly Levine when a fingerprint was found on the hood of their car. One single fingerprint. It was a good print and it led them to killer Billy Ray Ballard. It took four years for this print to be matched. And it wasn't until he went to prison for another crime in Wyoming that they caught him for the murder of the, t the couple for Edward and Kimberly. Kimberly's parents then spent two years trying to get the state of Washington to extradite Ballard from the prison in Wyoming where he was serving time. They didn't want to spend the money, according to the father's statement. Washington didn't want to? Right. Um, okay. So he really had to like put pressure on, on this to get this taken care of. Billy Ray Ballard pled guilty to both those murders and he was sentenced to life without parole in Washington. So after he finished his time in wyoming uh -huh. he would then be sent to a washington prison to serve life without parole so you know that that solves that which they didn't really think was linked to the other two couples yeah. murders but at least it got some you know clear resolution for that family yeah and it you know eliminated any possibility that they thought that ballard was related you know could be the person of interest in these other two murders yeah. Or, you know, couples murders. Years again go by, no sign of Mike Reamer, and there's no other leads. I mean, Ruth, Stephen, and Diana, um, just there's no resolution for them. Huh. It's 25 years to be exact. And then remains were found on a, another isolated logging road just north of Mineral, Washington, which is right where the other three bodies were found. A hiker was out in the woods, came across a fully intact skull. This was March 26, 2011. It was a mile from where Diana had been found near Mike's truck. No other remains were found, just the skull. Hmm. Medical examiners were able to positively ID the skull as that of Mike Reamer using dental records. Oh, wow. So, again, it's a little bit of closure to the family and friends that had gone for so long without knowing what had happened to Mike but there's no way of knowing how he died. Yeah. They don't know 
how long his, that had been out there. Mm-hmm. It also put an end to any possible person of interest that the authorities had in the other deaths. Yeah. This did revive the case, however, um, as cold case detectives resumed their searches for any other clues or the rest of Mike's remains in that area. Still no other update on that. So mm. they have his skull. They don't know how he died. They don't know how long he had been out there. Yeah. It's, it's odd because the area had been searched, not only by Mike's friends, but by investigators. It had been searched. But his girlfriend was found, the school was found somewhere else also. So Diana was found next to his truck. Okay. Ruth was the one who was found oh. separated from Stephen. Stephen was found in the car. Ruth was found a ways away. Okay. So, and yes, they found her skull first and then they found her body a couple of days later in that same area. Yeah. I just think it's odd how heavily searched that area was. Yeah. And they, they didn't find that skull. They didn't find a body. Yeah. So kind of out of nowhere, there it is. It's just really odd because you would think over time, more brush, more debris would find, would make finding that harder, not easier. And here just comes a hiker going through the woods and finds a skull. Yeah. I don't know. It seems kind of, it just seems odd to me. And, and they can't find anything else. You know, there's nothing else in that area. There's no other clues, nothing. Yeah. So this is where the murders stand. Unfortunately, that is the last update was 2011. If the authorities have any leads, they aren't sharing them. Mm -hmm. If there's any evidence that has been kept that could have been tested for DNA, there's no mention of it anywhere. Yeah. And from what I can see, there have been no further updates made to the public since the remains of Mike Reamer were found. And when was that? Uh, 2011. 2011 that's right. March of 2011. The Mineral Washington murders are one of the most searched crimes when anyone like Google's true crime in Washington. They have been featured on numerous blogs, podcasts. They've been on Unsolved Mysteries twice. And nothing. There, if if there are any leads, if there are any persons of interest, if there is anything that the investigators know, they are very tight lipped on it. Yeah. They're not letting it out. Hmm. And I thought it was interesting because a lot of, like I said, there's some wild speculation out there. There's trying to link these murders to Gary Ridgway. There's trying to, um, there's like, well, Mike did it, and then she, then he killed himself, and he came back. And killed himself near where Diana was. Yeah. And that, but there again, you would think you would find the remains of the body. And if he killed himself, chances are he would have shot himself in the head. That's, that's the most common form of somebody doing that. Unless he like drink poison or something, which is just kind of odd. Yeah. Yeah. So whatever they have on this case it's it's closed it's they're not letting anybody know there's no updates wow yeah um and i think like i said i think that is just why it is so widely looked at like there's so much speculation there's so much um unknown that people are just going wild with these ad- accusations and thoughts and yeah yeah and there's just no way to know. It's just kind of, it's kind of open for any possibility. Yeah. Yeah. And as I mentioned, being respectful to the families who have lost their loved ones is, is really important. You know, over the years, people have tried to get Diana and Mike's daughter to speak on this. Of course, there were all sorts of comments about she, she's two years old when this happened. Right. You think about what a two-year-old remembers and thinks about, and maybe at yeah. the time she might have been able to give them some information, and maybe it, maybe it just wasn't handled well. I don't know. But also, why would you want to traumatize a two-year-old? Yeah, you know, well, with ha- making them the relive 80s, that, yeah. you know. And then as an adult, people make comments all over the place about like, oh, she should go into like hypnosis therapy to try to remember things. Why would she want to do that? Yeah. 
nobody wants to do that. This is a horrific event that changed her life for, you know, forever. Yeah. Why would she want to, to do that? You know, and, and she, I'm sure had to come with to like some acceptance. And I, I don't presume to speak for anybody who's lost a loved one this way, but you at some point have to come to the acceptance. I would, I would think I'm not going to know. I've lost my parents yeah. and it's been in a horrible way and I'm not going to know what happened. And you can either stay stagnant or you can live your life to the best and the fullest and, and just try to, to be the type of person that your parents would want you to be, mm-hmm. you know? So yeah, she, she doesn't want to have anything to do with, with this kind of thing. And I completely respect that. She just wants to live her life. Um, she's asked for her privacy. She deserves it as do any of these family members that don't want to speak about this. They yeah. just don't. My hope is that, like I said, more information is found something like DNA, something, you know, someone comes forward with information so that the person responsible for this can be held accountable. Yeah. And that that's really what the outcome should be. Not yeah. I, making I people think, dredge up stuff. I think with more resources available to everybody, and just as an example, you know, Michelle McNamara, you know, just yeah. solving the golden, well, not her, but, you know, big breaks in that case. Oh, yeah, for sure. I think civilian researchers, you know, have a lot more resource and time to focus yeah. on one as to where the police department have multiple, you know, um, cases, cold cases or current cases open. Right. These civilian independent people can, you know, concentrate on just the one case and just, I mean, dig deep into it. I, I just yeah. think you don't have to involve the family, but at least, you know, give someone a shot at it. And I mean, that's what happened in the gold Golden State Killer case. Is someone right. was like, hey, "You want to look at it? Fine, here." Right. I I do think I've seen. I mean, obviously, we've seen that work in that case and other cases like it. You know, there's there's been other cases that have not been um, as widely put across the media as that case. But there there are other cases that are that are coming up that are being solved by that type of of means. Yeah. I've also seen it like in the case with um, Mara Murray. Have you heard of her? No. She's it's East Coast. It's not West Coast. So I I have looked at it, mm-hmm. but it's not something I was going to research for for our purposes. Yeah. But she's been missing, and it was under highly like odd circumstances. Uh-huh. And her family has been very vocal about trying to find her, and you know what they're doing to try to find her. And there are people who have involved themselves to the point where they're they're putting themselves in danger by doing it. Yeah. And they're also not respectful of the family's wishes. And they're doing this outside of like the family's wishes. And it's almost to a level of of complete disrespect. Yeah, I get that. And that that is where, yes, it's I'm I'm apprehensive to to try to do that type of thing because I would I would hate for any involvement that I would I would give would be you know so outside of what the family's wishes would be that it it would be almost a hindrance. Yeah. And yeah, it's it's I kind of I've seen some things that some people have done and it's it's like you know at some point it's not your place. It's not your place. You can sit and put out your theories and you can you know, you can do that to whatever extent you want to do, but it's not your place to be that personally involved in something sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I think in the case of like Michelle McNamara, she was looking at it as a whole yeah. and it was, it was to give these victims a voice Yeah. because hey. there were so many connections that were eventually made that the victims kind of got put in the back it's like with ted bundy the victims got put in the back seat because Mm -hmm. ted bundy was this you know very flashy very egotistical um all over the place person and and i think that i think that in michelle mcnamara's case it was it was from a different place 
I see some of these other cases where people are going out there and it's for the glory of, I'm going to solve this. Yeah. And aren't you going to thank me for doing it? And no, I'm not. I'm not going to thank you for being an asshole and, and interjecting yourself into my family's grief. I'm not. That's, yeah. I don't, I could see where families just are like, please stop. Please stop doing it. I, mm, it's got to be done tastefully and respectfully, but. Yeah. No, but I think you're right. I think that, you know, the, the longer these cold cases go on, the less resources police authorities, investigators have. Yeah. They can't investigate every case until the end. They just can't. Yeah. And the one thing that still intrigues me about Michelle McNamara, now this is not going on, but she still thinks she believed that there was still a serial killer operating in the Northwest. Yeah. And I, there's a good possibility that she's right. Yeah. I mean, I, cause that's one of the things that comes up when I do like searches, does Washington have a, a serial killer? But when, when uh, yes. I think, I mean, yes. Probably. After <laughs> three seasons of you telling me these things, yes, they do. <laughs> I think, I think when you're looking at the Pacific Northwest though, there are people, not right now because of the pandemic, there are people that move between the U.S. border and the Canadian border. Yeah. There are people that move into, I mean, Idaho's right there. Oregon's right there. Northern California is not hard to get to. Um, there are people that travel in that area yeah. that it could come in, commit a crime, and easily move out. And you can't not get into Canada, that, even but... like the reservations, too. Well, and it, I mean, that's another thing. There, there are so many missing and murdered indigenous women yeah. in this area. Yeah, there's somebody coming out. There's, that is not a coincidence that it's, it's multiple different people. Yeah, This area, very unique in, in like, you know, uh, territories and different states, you know, yeah. whether it be, you know, Washington, Oregon, Cali, Idaho, and then into Canada, but also, you know, the private, the Native American reservations. There's a ton right. of and operating in the state park. There are so many state parks here, man. Right. Well, there's just so much area that is not inhabited. Yeah. And doesn't, doesn't get traveled very much. No. It's not hard to place a body. And yeah, I mean, that is, that is one of the things that's also discussed is it's, this area is... It's it's a playing ground. It's a playground yeah. for anybody who wanted to commit a crime and cover it up. I, I it kind of really is. Unfortunately, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful areas, but you you could go and place a a body and cover up your tracks if you went to the yeah. right place up here. It's a beautiful area with a dark and sinister <laughs> undertow. Yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, there is nothing as creepy as the woods at night when it's like foggy and sometimes it's kind of a religious experience to me because sometimes it's very calming and sometimes it's just the creepiest thing in the fucking world. Yeah. Yeah. So those unsolved murders are, I don't know. I, I just wish, I wish for resolution and those it's, it's so long, you know, almost my entire lifetime. So I would have been seven when those happened Yeah, to not have resolution for families that long. I, I just can't imagine. No. I can't imagine it. It, it's just, too, it's too long. And yeah, my, my hope is that at some point there is, there's information that comes out that, that can solve that, take care of that. That's what we got. Uh, we just want to say thank you to everyone who's tuned in to listen. If you recently found us, don't worry. We're not going to be gone long. We have quite a few episodes that you can, you know, go back through. Please, please, you know, catch up. And remember what the fuck Wednesdays begin September 15th. And then we will be back just in time with a Halloween special for season four. Are you, are you ready for season four? Yes. You're not. <laughs> Please, in the meantime, send us any suggestions that you have on cases, even if it isn't in the Pacific Northwest, like Washington. 
we might still cover it. It might, if it has links to the state, if it's, you know, in this general area, you never know. We yeah. might discuss it. So I mean, we did one that had links to Washington, but you know, the guy was from Australia. I mean, we love all and any suggestions. Yes. So just let us know if you, if you have something, we'd love to cover it. Until we meet again, my friends, stay safe and well, and stay out of the damn woods. Stay out of the woods. Thanks, Bryce, for a good season. (laughs) Happy season three close. Bye. Bye.